few writers have a voice as distinctive and as instantly recognisable as Dylan Thomas. His colourful and complex style is present from the first poems he ever published and only got stronger throughout his career. The reason for this is that few writers are as inextricably linked to their environment as Dylan Thomas was. His voice wasn't just his own, it was the voice of Wales. Dylan Thomas was one of the first poets I ever read that really made me realise the true possibilities of language. His writing was full of complex imagery and phrases that I'd never heard before and it was written in a style that I'd never seen in any other poet I'd ever read. He didn't fit into any particular school or genre of writing, uh, even though he grew up and started writing during the modernist era, it was still distinctive in its own right. And it was twisted into these odd rhythms and turns of phrase that I didn't realise for a long time were actually the products of the Welsh language. So to understand his writing, we first need to understand where he came from. Dylan Thomas was born in Swansea in 1914 to modest circumstances the son of a seamstress and a school teacher. His parents made an effort to teach their children the Welsh language, something which had a huge influence on his later work. Thomas's childhood summers were divided between the Welsh coast and the farms of his many relatives in the rolling countryside. The images he saw in these early years are repeated again and again in his later poetry and obviously held an idyllic place in his mind. Most famously, they're revisited in his great poem, Fern Hill. Nothing I cared in the lamb white days, that time would take me up to the swallow thronged loft by the shadow of my hand, in the moon that is always rising, nor that riding to sleep I should hear him fly with the high fields, and wake to the farm forever fled from the childless land. Oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. He was a reluctant and unsuccessful pupil, but began writing poetry during his school years. He also discovered journalism at this time, and left school at age 16 to work for the South Wales Evening Post. He worked for a number of publications over the next five years, and wrote poetry in his private time excessively. It's estimated that half of his total poetic output was written by the time he was 20. These poems commonly focused on ideas of life and death cycles, of destruction and creation. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age. To blast the roots of trees is my destroyer. And I am dumb to tell the crooked rose, my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. Thomas's first collection, 18 Poems, was published in 1934, and his style quickly got the attention of the industry. It was reviewed favourably in papers, and even won an award. Most importantly, it introduced him to the literary world of London. Thomas was beginning to discover the theatre and the performing arts at the same time the industry was beginning to discover him. To be closer to the literary world, Thomas relocated to London. It was there that he met his future wife, Caitlin McNamara. She had run away to London to become an actress, and the two hit it off instantly. Although she was already in a relationship, they began an affair and were married within a year. These days, Dylan Thomas is known for two things, his poetry and his drinking. As his profile as a writer in London grew, so did his reputation for hard drinking and hard partying. Caitlin had a taste for the same vices and the two of them fueled each other on as they travelled constantly between homes in London and Wales. Importantly, during this time, they began a connection with a fishing village called Larne in Wales, where they would live periodically for the rest of Dylan Thomas's life. His second collection of poetry, 25 Poems, was published in 1936 and was almost exclusively composed of poems that he'd written during his teens. The reception was still very positive as it was for his first collection and his image in the public was becoming more concrete as the days went on. His third collection, The Map of Love, was released in 1939, about the same time that the Second World War was breaking out across Europe. This volume was actually a commercial failure, unlike his earlier work. Uh, the next year, in 1940, he released a short story collection called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Dog, and again, it was mostly a failure. The Thomases were very poor at this time, and borrowed heavily from family and friends. Dylan avoided conscription to the war due to his poor health, having suffered respiratory illnesses for most of his life. As a result, he began writing scripts for the BBC back in London, which brought him closer to traditional media and also the exciting nightlife he'd grown to love. 
The Thomas's three children were born during this time. The first in 1939, the second in 1943, and the third in 1949. They moved back and forth between their home in London and Wales and managed to stay safe throughout the war. Thomas began a series of affairs in these years, at the same time his public image began to change. His work for the BBC included many recordings, including those of his own work, and these became increasingly popular due to his rich voice and the almost mythic quality of the poems. He appeared on more and more art and culture broadcasts on the BBC, and when his next collection, Deaths and Entrances, was released in 1946, it was a massive critical success. The poems included idyllic recollections of his childhood, like Fernhill, as well as direct responses to the horrors of war. Deep with the first dead lies London's daughter, robed in the long friends, the grains beyond age, the dark veins of her mother, secret by the unmourning water of the riding Thames. After the first death, there is no other. Thomas's relationship with the BBC began to be strained about this time because of his excessive drinking, uh, but he was still very popular with the public, so he maintained a presence on air, especially in radio plays and theatrical broadcasts. Probably very suitably, he was cast to play Satan in an adaptation of Paradise Lost. The Thomases moved in 1949 to a boathouse in Larne, purchased by one of Dylan's benefactors. He also took ownership of a writing shed near the house on a cliff overlooking the rugged Welsh coast. Always introspective, his writing continued to reflect on his life and childhood. He worked for the rest of his life on a play for voices that he named Under Milk Wood. The sprawling, surreal work explores the thoughts and dreams of the inhabitants of a fictional fishing village, clearly inspired by his home on the Welsh coast. It was never fully completed during his lifetime, although he did perform parts of it during the famous reading tours he was soon to complete. Between 1950 and 1953, Thomas undertook four tours of the United States. The aim was to read at colleges he'd been invited to, but the tours themselves became notorious for the wild parties they involved. Thomas attended functions and gatherings and drank to excess, even attending some of his readings drunk and incoherent. It became such a problem that his lung conditions were made worse and he started to develop gout. His image outside of Europe was all but established by this point as a raucous, rambling bard, and his behaviour did much to cement it. His death sealed that reputation forever. During his fourth tour, Dylan Thomas died in New York City of extensive health failings, complicated by drug and alcohol abuse. He was 39 years old. When I first learned about his life, Thomas always seemed to me like the sort of poet who knew he wouldn't live very long. He was loud and boisterous as a person and seemed very self-conscious of his image and what legacy he would leave behind. I suppose the place that's most obvious is in his writing, which from the start focused on life and death cycles. So I want to finish up with a final poem. It was written on his 35th birthday as he strolled along the coastline of Wales under the cliffs of his home. I hear the bouncing hills grow larked and greener at Berry Brown Fall, and the dewlarks sing taller this thunderclap spring, and how, more spanned with angels ride the man-souled fiery islands. O oh, holier than their eyes, and my shining men no more alone, as I sail out to die. Alright, so thank you for watching. If you haven't read Dylan Thomas's poetry before, absolutely check it out. It is amazing. Like I've said, it's like nothing you've ever read before. I cannot explain how much it is difficult to read half of those ones out loud. Uh, the words that he jams together become like tongue twisters when you try and pronounce them coherently. Um, while you're here, subscribe to the channel because these videos are fun to make and it's even better when people watch them. I'll be back soon, so until then, have a good week, month, year, and I'll see you later.